Can I put you next to me? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, first we're gonna, I'm gonna do the house rules, yeah? Uh, okay, all right. Well, welcome everyone. I wanted to go through some house rules for Bloomberg Television. This is a big honor to be first off in, in Africa at such an exciting time and to be to have been invited by the World Economic Forum to moderate this panel. Um, just a, a couple of things that will help us make it as interesting as it can be. First off, um, I would ask the people on the sides, if you don't mind, to move into the center so we can fill the sort of, does that work? WEF people, or, or, and the people at the back, if you could move forward. Sort of, we want to fill the center and, and fill out from there. Thank you very much. While you're doing that, I would remind you it would be extremely helpful if you turn off your telephones. And I'll actually give you some time to do that. As for questions, Please do ask questions. There's nothing worse for a moderator than a, an audience that doesn't ask questions. So please do that. But when you do, just uh, a couple of things. First off, please stand when you ask a question. Identify yourself. <laughs> Identify who you're directing your question to, because we do have five uh, panelists today. And finally, and I mean this respectfully, please make sure that your question is actually a question. Right. Oh. <laughs> We've all been at panels where they've been hijacked by speeches, right? So um, enough of that. Not, don't mean to lecture. Um, as for your microphones, all of you, you can be assured your microphones do work. This was something that the technical guys asked me to let you know. You don't need to worry. Anyone who wants to use a microphone, just assume it's working. No need to tap it or, or do anything like that. Uh, the structure of this conversation is quite simple. Uh, we're going to have a conversation amongst uh, the speakers to begin with, and then uh, I'm going to bring, or they are more than welcome uh, to bring you into the conversation. So just let us know or me know that you would like to ask a question, and we're going to make sure that happens. Uh, and finally, I, you know, if, if it wasn't already clear, I wanted to point out that we at Bloomberg Television are going to televise this, so you're going to have to unfortunately tolerate a little TV part at the beginning where I address the camera over there instead of looking at you, which would be, of course, more natural, wouldn't it? So, so that's it. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, this should be a very interesting panel, and uh, I think we'll, we'll begin, and, during which I will introduce, of course, our, 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 our speakers. Just two. Phil, are you happy with that? Yes, that was me. Yeah. Yeah. You happy? How can the international community work better with Africans to build the continent's economies and are the current partnerships actually helping an Africa on the rise? I'm Ryan Chilcote. Welcome to Bloomberg's panel at the World Economic Forum in Cape Town and please give a very warm welcome to our distinguished speakers. With us today, we have Mustafa Koch, chairman of Koch Holdings, Turkey's largest industrial group, and an investor, now a direct investor in South Africa. Mario Machango, chairman of Millennium BIM, Mozambique's largest bank, former prime minister of Mozambique. Pumzile Mlambo Nutka, who runs an educational foundation here called U Mlambo. Uh, that is focused on teaching princ uh, principals at schools to be better leaders. She is also a former vice president of South Africa. Jin Kwa Chon, special representative of the Chinese government here in Africa and former ambassador for China to South Africa, a post he gave up just last year. And finally, on the flank, we have 
the Foreign Minister of Sweden, Mr. Carl Bildt. Thank you very much all for joining us. Pumzile, I'm going to uh, put the first question to you. How would you characterize the state of cooperation between, let's say, South Africa and uh, the international community in, in terms of helping uh, South Africa and South Africans grow economically? Well, I think South Africa is now at a stage where we don't get a lot of aid type support, but it's more opportunities for investment and for business. Our side of the bargain is to make the environment attractive and uh, to cut the red tape and all the other things that business people complain about. And uh, the side of the business is obviously to make meaningful uh, investments, especially in the parts of the economy where we need investment. Manufacturing, for instance, being one as a country that has a strong uh, natural resource industries, we would like to see a value addition in, in, in South Africa and investment in human resource, which is always a problem in some aspects, in fact, in a lot of aspects of our economy. So if business is able to couple its investment with investment in human resources, that clearly makes the partnership more exciting for us. Ambassador uh, Chon, I wanted to ask you, um, first off, about, I guess, Africa's relation, China's relationship with Africa, trade now at $200 billion, is that right? Near the figure, yes. You're, you'll be well aware that there's a conversation in Africa, not only in Africa, that um, perhaps uh, China's role on the continent is inappropriate, that it's gone from a helping hand to uh, and an investor to, as uh, the, central, uh, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria just put it, as, as something of a colonialist. Uh, what would you say to that? Of course, I cannot agree with the kind of accusation saying that China trade with Africa is kind of colonialist style. The reason for some people to criticize this is because they think the structure of that kind of trade by, for African countries by selling materials out and buying manufactured goods is bad, it's colonial style. And uh, the reason for that I can quite understand, but the result, the result 50 years ago and the result of today is totally different. Because in those days, when the, in the kind of colonial system, you sell your material with such a minimum price, like sometimes six cents a barrel. With that kind of exportation, the African country can barely feed themselves by exporting. But now with the price of over 100 US dollars in barrel, that huge difference is that by this kind of exportation, you can not only feed yourself, but you can also accumulate the capital mm. for your own development. Particularly, you can put money in the infrastructure. This is a totally different result. Because every country need to start from some point for its own development. The investment, the money will not come to Africa for nothing. So with change of this kind of raw material for not only your food, your clothes, your housing, but also for the development and for the infrastructure, this is some kind of starting point. With starting from here, we will see a rising Africa. So I don't think the trade at the present, at this time, with this kind of price for both sides is colonialist at all. No, it is not. Mr. Bachungu, let me ask you, uh, the view from Mozambique, home to uh, the biggest natural gas find in a decade. Mozambique is in a unique situation where it has to, it needs to uh, be very careful to make sure that that resource is actually helpful to the people of, uh, of Mozambique. I know you don't agree with the, the uh, editorial that, that Mr. Sanusi wrote. And, 
don't see China as, as evil. Uh, how, can you, uh, how, how can you go about now uh, building relationships with international organizations? I mean, are, are you worried that you know, they're basically interested in your gas and, and, and nothing more? Yes, I think that the, we have discovered huge amount of gas and we are going to, as George said, we are going to continue to discover more gas as offshore or inshore in Mozambique. But we're starting, we're not exploding yet. But we have a, a responsibility in Mozambique on building conditions so that we can benefit all of us from these natural resources exploitation. One very important step that we can really take is really human resource capabilities. From the beginning, we have to know how to discuss our contracts, how to bargain, how to take advantages of these natural resources. This is without really experts and the capable human resource we are going to lose our future. There's an issue with the people in Mozambique, the, the Mozambique themselves being prepared. Pre prepared. Mm. And I think that we are preparing ourselves in order to make up a global, a, a long-term view, a prospective view, and explain to our people what we want to do in Mozambique with this wealth. And everybody has to understand Everybody have a, a role to play in the development of Mozambique. For entrepreneurs, government, communities, everybody have to know what is our object, what are our objectives, what steps we are going to do. This depends on us. That doesn't depend on the international community or other partners. That depends on us. What we are going to do in the future depends on Mozambique people and Mozambique government. Mr. Coach, you just made a pretty sizable investment in the South African economy in the last <coughs> couple of years, purchasing a manufacturer from a manufacturer here, uh, Defy. How do you intend to go about helping Africa, um, in South Africa specifically, um, in its development through, through uh, your investment? Well, first of all, I, will, I would like to discuss a little bit about the history of, of our relations as, as a country and as a company with the sub-Saharan uh, countries, which goes back uh, not very late, but almost ten, a decade ago. Uh, before, we had very historically strong uh, trade uh, and cultural and political ties with the North African countries. Mm. But uh, in the last uh, 10 years, with the new administration and with a very proactive uh, Turkish foreign policy, uh, Turkish companies have been very, very active in uh, sub-Saharan countries. Turkish Airlines have been flying 37 destinations. 37, is 37 which is extraordinary. That's, that's, that's very big. And uh, the numbers of uh, embassies rose from 8 to 31 in the last three years in such a short, short time. And uh, the Turkish uh, goods were uh, flowing in and uh, in, in the areas of um, construction and infrastructure, uh, they were also very, very active. And the number, the trade volume has risen tenfold from uh, two to $20 billion in the uh, last decade. When you look at Chinese figures, of, of course, we have a long way to go. But when you consider the point where we're coming from, the level, it's quite impressive. And the government is also is very, very active and helpful for Turkish companies to do that. When uh, we come to our uh, story, uh, we had to differentiate our markets because we didn't want to have our uh, ex in, in export activities, our <coughs> eggs in one basket, where we were concentrating very heavily on, on Europe. And uh, once the crisis had started, uh, one of our best businesses or core business, I would say, is appliance business. Uh, we have decided to tap on uh, South, of South Africa uh, and, and uh, include DeFi to our portfolio, which was a perfect match. And you believe that 
investing in running in, uh, a, a manufacturing firm here in, in South Africa is, is a, presumably, obviously, a, a way to help South Africa develop. I suppose a lot of uh, nations who are looking at, at uh, sub-Saharan Africa or Africa as a whole, a lot of people are emphasizing or concentrating on natural resources, as it was mentioned before. Whereas uh, we are a very uh, long-term committed for uh, South Africa's and the neighboring nations' welfare and uh, growth. So uh, we have decided to do an investment in production, which is the largest <coughs> Turkish investment in, in Africa so far. Minister Bill, let, let me ask you, uh, you know, to, to be fair, and not just uh, beat up on, on uh, and ask provocative questions of our colleague from, from the government of China. <laughs> uh, President Zuma recently said that uh, Western companies need to change the way they do business in Africa and in South Africa. Do you think, you know, as, as an individual that's involved in formulating the European Union's policy on Africa, uh, corporations need to think, change the way they do business here? Well, that is, of course, entirely dependent upon the individual businesses. I mean, there might be bad ones, there might be good ones. But in general terms, the relationship is, of course, changing, both from the governmental point of view and from the private point of view. Um, there are sort of individual links between individual European and African countries. There's a long history there. But essentially, it's been, to a large extent, a relationship centered around development aid for a fairly long time. I mean, the European Union provides roughly 70% of all of development aid in the world, and the bulk of that, I would argue, goes to Africa. That's still going to be, very, and Sweden among them, being, being one, one of the biggest contributors for a very long time. But gradually, of course, the relationship is changing over to trade, investment, and I would also add political cooperation on peace and security issues, trying to support the building up of integration and cooperation in Africa, the African Union, absolutely essential to the future of, of the continent. Then look at individual aspects of it. I mean, just mention one where, by chance, Sweden is fairly heavily engaged. The telecommunications. I, I, I saw the African Development Bank said, estimated that roughly half of the improvement in the growth prospect of Africa during the last few years can be attributed to the mobile telecommunication technologies. They are rolling out all over the place. Mm. They're transforming Africa. They're opening up new horizons primarily for the new generation. And we have a partnership, Sweden, Ericsson, with roughly 10 African countries rolling out what we call broadband for all. And in a couple of years, say five years, I would think that most of Africa will be covered by mobile, band with mobile broadband networks. That is a huge issue when it comes to creating new possibilities for economic, political, social development of, of the countries. But it requires careful management, and that's why the partnership is, is an important aspect of it. Mr. Coach, if I could ask you, when you look at, um, and please feel free to jump in on one another without me asking questions, when you look at uh, Turkey and what you're doing in Turkey, um, and you look at South Africa, the new market that you've, you've entered over the last couple of years, what similarities do you see? And, and do you see any room for what you're already doing in Turkey uh, that, that could be useful here um, in, in South Africa that, that helps you, of course, but also helps uh, development? First of all, when you look at the demogra demographics, uh, there are a lot of parallels. It's an uh, emerging market, a young population, dynamic market, the legislations and uh, regulations are more, more uh, functioning properly. And when we look at the micro level uh, between Koch Group's Archelic division and DeFi, uh, we have a lot of similarities. Uh, strong market position, uh, very good brand awareness, a very strong sales and after sales service, uh, an excellent uh, uh, knowledge of uh, local brands. Uh, so we, that was a perfect fit, but of course it also brings its uh, challenges uh, in terms of social development with it, and uh, to 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 find proper uh, qualified uh, skilled uh, labor force becomes always a challenge. 
not only for us, but for also other industries, I'm sure. In that sense, we have launched a program in Turkey uh, to develop the vocational schools, which are very, very important to find the right people, uh, to develop the right skills for the right industry. And I think that would be very uh, instrumental uh, for, for South Africans uh, to do something like that if they haven't done it yet. Um, and statistically, it's proven in Turkey that these graduates of these schools have much better chance to find a proper uh, job than a normal college graduate. Because after all, the college graduate, once they start doing business, uh, they have to be trained at the beginning. Whereas here, or let's put it this way, when you have 10, 11 percent unemployment, and when you have difficulties finding a foreman in one of the fa your factories, that's a serious problem. Madam Nutka, maybe instead of talking so much about what hasn't worked, what would you like to see in terms of uh, what would be really useful, perhaps in addition to or on the back of that kind of idea in, in South Africa to move South Africa forward? And I would strongly support the idea where an investor has a determined training program to enhance its, its productivity and its business, but hopefully also to train for surplus so that uh, people can also become self-employed using those same skills or for that matter, uh, maybe not necessarily work for competition, but work in the economy. And I think uh, the investment that uh, Mr. Cause is talking about, DeFi is one of the homegrown South African companies so for us, it is actually exciting if uh, we see some of our technologies. Uh, I think people of my age group in South Africa may still remember Defy. Uh, but right now, there's been lots in the markets that we even forget about that brand. So hopefully, <laughs> that uh, creates an exciting um, opportunity um, as, as well. So yes, a collaboration of investment in manufacturing, in infrastructure, that comes with uh, uh, training is, is, is most welcome. I also just want to highlight the, the need in, in the South African economy for the networking infrastructure, the ICT-related infrastructure, railroad and, and air, uh, for that matter, we still have uh, possibilities in that. And of course, uh, energy, which everybody knows about, is, is an area where they, we've, got, uh, we've got great needs. And all of that infrastructure, all of that kind of investment um, that uh, has a direct contribution uh, to, to the performance of our economy, it's something that we go around looking for. Ambassador Chon, uh, I, I, I guess I, I should say I was laughing there because before we got here, Mr. Coach was mentioning when you, when you, t when you talked about the brand Defy, Mr. Coach was saying that, uh, in fact, uh, since he's come to South Africa, uh, he's been engaged in quite a, a, a fight for, for market share with uh, Korean and Chinese companies. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that it's it's uh, getting that, tougher and tougher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that this is a co competitive place for yeah. international companies competing with one another yeah. um, and uh, uh, maintaining jobs at a minimum in, in South Africa. I wanted, Ambassador Chun, I wanted to ask you if there's a misperception about uh, China's role here uh, in, in Africa, um, and if China is doing things that, that aren't just about uh, grabbing resources? Of course, people always try to find some place or something that can cause other people's attention. So criticize China becomes sometimes a little bit fashionable, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Here and there, and uh, trying to do this. Just like um, Mr. Coach said that competition here in this continent sometimes is fierce. I also have heard Chinese companies complain about when they failed in the competition, they complain about that. I say, blame yourself if you <laughs> fail in the competition. But I always, I always uh, think it's a good thing to compete. China suffered a lot when we start our own reform and open policy. Because suddenly we see the flood coming into China from Western country, the kind of goods, which is better quality, lower price. And uh, in the first 10 years, we see thousands of companies and the factories go bankruptcy. Millions of works 
workers lay redundant or simply be uh, go unemployed. And the whole society is full of frustration and uh, anxiety about what is happening, what are we doing? But eventually, when these Chinese businessmen start to learn how to become competitive and to compete, now every, everyone knows what is happening now in China. In a lot of fields, Chinese goods become cheaper, better, or up to the market standard. So one point in the article published by the governor of Nigerian Central Bank is that, I see this as a bright point, is that he called on African people, shall we come to compete with the Chinese? In manufacturing. Mm -hmm. In every field. Yeah. That's something very good. Because our success is out of our competition with, with the people who come to work, who come to do business in China. So I think it's very good for African people to say that now is the time we come to compete with you. Actually, the job when I was ambassador in South Africa is to help the textile industry in South Africa to find out what went wrong here. I invite a group of Chinese experts, textile industry, come to try to diagnose. Because we, we want this kind of competition here. If the African textile industry come to compete with China and eventually win the Chinese textile industry. I see that's good. Because when you, in some part of the competition you lose, you move up to some other area and leave this room to the better one to play here. It's a win-win. It's a win-win situation we want to create. So now I think the big challenge for Chinese company and for Chinese people is that how to help Africa to compete with us and to win us in certain area. Then the job and the, some of the manufacturer will come into this continent and to make Africa a really coming up economy and meet the, meet, meet the demand of its own people. Mm. This is what happened in China before. We want to repeat it here. Madam Nuka, I know you don't agree with the view that, uh, that it's appropriate to blame China for anything. Well, I, th I think that it's a one-sided argument. It's even worse when it comes from the West, because, I mean, who's talking? What is this that the West has done which is so superior to the Chinese that, uh, you know, the, 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 they have to be the ones that are criticizing? And I'm not saying that there isn't some practices that may, you know, may not be desirable. But also, as, as, as governments, as regulators in Africa, we also have a responsibility to regulate people who do business in our countries. So what are the things that we do not accept, and why do we allow it? So I, I don't think that it's blame. just, I just don't think that it's just as simple as that, that, well, well there's something wrong with the Chinese and, and therefore we're victims. Why are we victims in our own countries? Mm. So I just think that uh, it's, 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 it's more complex than that. And I, I actually find it quite uh, rich when it comes from the West. Uh, Mario Machuga, I know you were talking about in, in Mozambique, that Mozambique actually had, I guess you could call it manufacturing in the sense of um, cashew nut processing, and it used to be the world's biggest processor of cashew nuts. And that somehow, um, as uh, the outside world tried to help Mozambique, it, it, it destroyed that part of the economy. Yeah, uh, what uh, uh, Madame has said, it's, uh, it's very crucial and important to, to stress and agree completely with her. Uh, because uh, we need to be our, to have ownership of our policy, internal policy. Find what we want, how we want, and to whom to partner. And not to receive direction from outside, do that and do that and that one. When we are absorbing outside directions, we are losing our personality, our ownership. What happened with cashew, cashew, uh, cashew industry in Mozambique? 
just we have pressured to change our policy, to defend our industry in Mozambique, and what happened is to destroy jobs, to destroy industry, and to stop the development of casual. Mozambique was accused of effectively being having protectionist policies in defending its its processing. But yes, plans. We, 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 we have been <coughs> accused of that, but who have hadn't who haven't uh, defended uh, a protected policy? So many countries, even those who criticize us, they have a protected policy before in order to get, to have really a, a, a very development. <laughs> and so you opened up your market, and what happened to the, uh, your cashew processing? Yeah. We would open market. Yeah. But, uh, yes, we, 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 now with open market, we are now beginning again to rehabilitate our cashew, cashew net uh, industry in order really to compete again uh, with the, uh, and, and when you opened it up in the beginning, under pressure from outside of uh, Africa, mm. w w where did the cashew processing go? Where, where, where did it go? Uh, we go uh, the, the cashew processing went to, to those countries who had uh, really uh, some fashion to process it, like, like, like India, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> I will take, I, I completely agree with the last two statements. statements. But uh, African com countries have so many internal issues that is a big hurdle uh, in, in terms of uh, enhancing trade, logistics, mm. Mm. visa requirements. Yeah. Imagine, I just read a statistics that 80% of African companies have visa requirements to each other. Mm. As opposed, that number is 30% in Europe. So. These things have to be overcome before anything else. Just yesterday, I was at a, a business conference of Nigeria and South Africa, where they were discussing introducing a, a, was a visa, a, the easing visa restrictions between Africa's two largest economies. That that certainly seems surprising to me that there were even visas. Sorry, you were going to say. Yeah, uh, to 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 make. Trade much easier in this continent is is very vital. I think it's it's, it's 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 important. I think not only the visa. Of course, people are talking about visa, about the, the free free flow of people, but also the infrastructure is very important. Mm. I was told by my friend, the African uh, Union, say that the trade in this continent among themselves is only. 12% of the whole foreign trade of this continent. That means more than 80% of the trade first go to some other place in the world. And probably they still come back. The infrastructure on this continent is really a serious problem. Probably that's the inheritance from those colonial years. Because my influence or my place will not go directly to you. They first go to London, from London to Paris, and from Paris to another French-controlled place. That was the old structure and the old play that make this kind of cost of trade between African countries too big they can afford. One does have to wonder if the same 37 flights that exist between Turkey and Istanbul and Africa <laughs> so of exist come, within. A lot of people come to Istanbul that want to go to commute to Africa, and mm. it has become a huge hub now. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Minister Bill? No, I was going to make the same point. I mean, it's fairly obvious, and there I think Europe can demonstrate an example what we have gained by integration. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned they figured 12% for inter African trade. I think you. If you take away oil, it's going to be 21, roughly, slightly better. <laughs> okay. But in Europe, it's 65%. In Asia, it's 40%. Yes. And even if we talk, say, like Sweden, we are a country that have built our prosperity upon being successful on the trading side, being an open economy. And we trade with South Africa and China and Turkey and whatever. But primarily, we trade, as a matter of fact, with our close neighbors, of course. with the Germans and the Norwegians and other people, because the small and medium-sized enterprises, they are more comfortable trading nearby, and when they grow, then they go into the more faraway markets. And, and here I think there's a huge issue ahead for the leaders of Africa to take away these barriers. It's a question of infrastructure, 
needless to say, ports and railroads and airports and whatever, telecommunications again is important, but also sheer bureaucracy, sheer bureaucracy that is a legacy of a past period in the political development of, of these countries. Mm -hmm. And here, mm -hmm. Africa can, I mean, Europe one, might be one example, but you can look around the world and see the more integrated you are, the more open you are, the better is your growth prospect. And then, of course, the additional issue of really making that growth available for all, secondary issue. Mm -hmm. Well, come second, I would say, not the second day, but come second, first you need to have growth, and then you need to make certain that it reaches everyone. Uh, uh, the one, one quick question for, for any of you. You know, there's the, this phrase going around, um, quite popular right now. Africa doesn't need a handout, it doesn't need a hand up, it needs a handshake. Has, has the, the handout hurt Africa? And I, I, I've spoken with several business people, one in private equity, another that said actually when they were doing charity work here, they felt that they were less uh, uh, helpful in what they were trying to do in Africa than when they just pursued profit, because profit, they said, actually is, is what it creates jobs and needs to happen here. Well, you have to have profit to, in order to make philanthropic uh, aid. Activity, absolutely. So and in, in, they, they, they go hand in hand. Without realizing profit, you cannot do these things or charity work at all. I think all aid and no trade is a big problem. Um, countries are at dif different levels of development. If you look at the countries in Africa that are uh, least developed countries, and you're only going to focus on trade and not give any aid, that could be difficult. But uh, too much aid with no prospect for trade is mm -hmm. definitely a, you know, a, a big problem. So uh, again, I just don't think that it's a black, it's a black end answer, no. but uh, it's important for us to grow our economies at the back of genuine entrepreneurs because yes. aid is not going to give us that. And interestingly, I just point out, to the, the, let you go, that, the, that Great Britain just canceled its aid to South yes. Africa. I'm not sure it was a huge amount of aid, right? It was something like 30 million pounds. Mm. Mm. But the, the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom said something to the effect of, well, South Africa isn't the, uh, today isn't the South Africa that it was. 70s or 80s. Yeah, you were going to say. And yes, I was saying that uh, really it's very important to, 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 to build up infrastructure in our country mm -hmm. and to reshape our regional inst uh, cooperation institutions so that we can face together uh, the, the external partners. Why, why, why this is necessary? Because the creation of small medium enterprises which really collaborate on building a new economy, which really take advantages of the emerging economies eh, developing our countries, taking advantage of what we are producing now, eh, for instance, uh, medium, uh, small and medium enterprises, they are very important to spread out at the network of industrial uh, relations in our country, and so that the add value of our processing is, remains in our country. Because we, we have only big anchor, big industries, and without small and medium enterprise, eh, the intermediate, intermediate consumption will come from abroad, and we're not going, we're going, going to have a good, 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 good advantage on, on, on using our, our raw materials in, uh, in our countries. That's why I think that in regional level, we have to build our view on how to build up me, a small medium enterprise. The, mm. the, that means to build a medium, medium class, which is very important for the stability of countries, and for stability of business, and for the ability of uh, our macroeconomic policies. To recap, I think perhaps three clear takeaways from this conversation is that perhaps we shouldn't be talking about how international entities or overseas entities can help Africans grow. Um, perhaps the conversation should be about how Africans within this very large mm -hmm. continent 
can help one another to grow together. Mm -hmm. that, that should be the focus. Mm -hmm. The second, um, that Africans, as you were pointing out, need to define mm -hmm. uh, how they're going to, uh, their policies and how they're going to interact with, with other markets, and be it China, be it mm -hmm. uh, the European Union. And finally, that you know, maybe the West has no role here or anyone, uh, any uh, entity outside of Africa in dictating how that development should happen. I mean, those are three pretty obvious takeaways, I guess, from that conversation. Mm -hmm. Perhaps now we bring in um, uh, the audience. I'd, I'd ask you to please do ask questions, stand up, identify yourself, please, ma'am, and, and, and ask your question. Just tell us who, it, who it's for. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Lourdes Caposo Fernandes. I'm coming from Angola. I'm a lawyer. My question goes straight to Mr. Zong of China. Uh, my view of global partnerships on discussions we are having, it's more related with the most important thing for the success of any organization, who is human capital. So if human capital has not uh, success, I don't think anything has a success, because people make a difference. So I, I agree with the sentence that partnerships now are more shaking hands. So my point with China is how China is thinking on, on the experience of transferring know-how, know on training people from the country where you are investing. Why am I asking this? When we see China, coming and we, are, we, are, we agree in that, we, we believe on global partnerships and we, we want certain and all the countries coming to Africa and invest, but you have to trust people from the country where we're coming into. To, to be fair, okay? you need so, to, what's thank your you. question? To My question was, was that already done? What, yeah. How are you going to do to transfer knowledge to nationals from the countries? Thank you. Can I Instead add? of bringing too many Chinese for our country. <laughs> Can I add? Everybody has to do that, not just the Chinese. Yes. Yes. But the bulk yes. of the Western Good. investment, I understand they don't the question. do that. I understand the question. It's, yeah, you have a reason to, to complain. Angola become a particular case. Actually, uh, what I saw in, in Angola, not same in South Africa. Because the things happened quite differently here. You know, when you say China, I often think, which part of China you mean? Do you mean Chinese government or Chinese business? You know, sometimes they are not the same. But the government... It's not a monolithic. Yeah, we, we always try to encourage Chinese company to do things according to the local laws and the customer and the benefit them. But you, sometimes you, when you are a businessman, what you care most is not what government told them to do. It's something which brings me the biggest profit. When they can have a choice, finding the local people to fill in the post or finding the Chinese to do it, they always find the most economical one. Of course, for them, to find the Chinese guys coming to work for them could be easy to communicate, easy to do, probably even pay less than the local people. It's not the Chinese, only the Chinese government's regulation, but also the local government's regulation. That kind of thing not happening in South Africa because the immigration rules and the laws here is very strict. I went to one of the factory called the Heisen's. They employed 3,000 local workers working on the assembly line to produce TV, electric, white electric appliance, and supply the whole African continent. So Chinese government need to work together with the hosting country to enforce their immigration law, to let the, all these industry to provide the equal opportunities for the local labor market. But the one challenge is that can they provide a qualified labor force? This is one challenge. Sometimes we go too extreme. On one side, the business want to have all the employees be Chinese. But here, on the other side, the local NGOs, community societies want to have all the laborers to be their own people. And that's, that's but it's quite that, difficult. That's something that you were talking about as an issue in Mozambique. Yeah, sometimes we can do the trainee side by side working with a skilled Chinese worker. That's something we can try. We encourage that. 
I think both government, Chinese government, African government, need to do more to exploit the most healthy way to exploit and to develop the local skilled labor force and to face the challenge in the future. So even if Mozambique wanted uh, to have its own labor force do all the work um, in the gas fields to extract the gas, could it do that? Would, the, would the, the labor force of Mozambique be able to do that? At the moment, we, we can't do that, of course. We can't do that because we don't have a, a labor force training as, uh, experts uh, to, to, to work in the very, very Capital-intensive, specialized, and very capital-intensive uh, 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 work. It's very difficult. Well, Sir, d d right over here in the, in, in the middle. Sir, go ahead. <laughs> Can I go ahead? I, I will hand oh, over sure. This you, you may go ahead. Yes, yes I'm uh, the Minister of Finance from, um, from Rwanda. And mine, actually, uh, was just saying I agree with what they have said. Uh, and I agree with the emphasis on infrastructure. And we'll be talking about it in the next generation because this is something that is very, very expensive. But within the Africa, there are some small things that we can do that really can facilitate how we trade. And one of them is what we've done in Rwanda, that anybody from any country in Africa does not need a visa to come to Rwanda right now. Mm -hmm. And anybody coming from East African region does not need a work permit. Mm -hmm. And that has allowed the workers to come and start working the next day because you had a problem of the lower skills that you could not get anywhere so easily. And by just removing that, uh, 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 that blockage, it helped really in terms of contributing to economic growth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and to be fair, your, your question? And my question is, how, how, why can't we do, do this in Africa? In SADC, in East Africa, in ECOWAS, and other places. Why can't we just start with the basics? The non-tariff barriers, mm. the visas, mm. the work permits. If we just started with those ones, other things can follow. Right, well, Thank who you wants to answer why, uh, why Africa can't do it? Uh, you're looking at me. I'm guessing, <laughs> I'm guessing Mr. Coach doesn't want to answer that question. Well, I know because uh, South Africa sometimes, uh, right or wrong, has been accused of being the it's a very the elephant in the room, yeah. as far as that is concerned. But at the same time, we do have, we host the largest number of uh, Africans who are not South Africans in, in our country. People find a way of getting to, to South Africa. And I think we have been asking ourselves and about a, an orderly facilitated mechanism to attract skilled people, make it easy to, to, to come in, and at the same time also address the issue of brain drain. Because yeah. there is also a challenge that we face in Southern Africa, where South Africa can easily cream the top skills of many of our countries in the region, because there may be some aspects of our economy that are much more attractive than other countries, yeah. something that you also don't want. So, uh, I, see but, I, mean, shake, I, I see Mr. Pelt shaking his head over there. Yeah, but I mean, I, but I do agree that uh, uh, we definitely need to move forward to implement the non-tariff barriers and the agreements that we already have, but somehow we just don't get to implement them. Mr. Bill. No, but I was shaking my head because we've had exactly the same discussion in Europe, uh, particularly when it came to the, the enlargement with the new countries of the East, 100 million people. Mm -hmm. And there was the fear that there was going to be a brain drain, and indeed it happened. Uh, a lot of people moved from, say, Poland or Latvia or whatever, and they went to Sweden and the UK and whatever, but that's the first phase of it. The second phase is them acquiring skills mm. that they didn't have before and moving back mm. and then sort of contributing to the development of their own countries. Mm. So I think the overall experience that we have is that yes, they tend to move away for a while, but it is to the benefit of the development mm. of the countries themselves oh, yes. in the longer run. Long run. As a matter of fact, mm. critically important. Yeah, Please, sir, stand up and go ahead. So my name is Peter Draper. I'm vice chair of the Forum's Trade Council, uh, South African. The question goes to Ambassador Zhong. I'm really um, flattered. And it concerns China's special economic zones program for Africa. So I'm wondering, firstly, what is the strategic thinking behind it? Secondly, what are the mechanics? How would they work or how do they work, these special economic zones? And then thirdly, a request. Uh, can you transfer that knowledge to South Africa, where we have 
been trying for years to establish special economic zones but really haven't got off the ground. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the strategy, I sometimes doubt about that, there is such a strategy for China to develop some kind of things that we plan to set up this kind of uh, special economic zones in Africa. Because personally, I I'm sometimes not totally agree with that. You know, when China set up that special economic zone, it's because China is a quite isolated economic entity during the time when we start our open and the reform policy. That is, it's totally as isolated from the outside economic world. But we were very cautious that we don't want to open the door immediately to open to the probably economic flood come into China to, de to, to actually destroy, dis destroy us. So we will be cautious to open a small window there that to try whether we can get ourselves used to the economic order of the outside world. That's the meaning, that's the reason we set up this economic zoom. But when we come to this continent, I sometimes I joke to people, here is an open air. You don't even have the roof. Why do you want to open that window on the, on the, on the wall? Because it's a total, almost economic free zone here in this continent. So the market is much mature here, much more than our Chinese period in, in, when we start our reform. But eventually, I think probably it, it's a not totally the same story with what we have in China, suspect, a special economic zone. It's some kind of industrial asset. Uh, it is not for the open policy on, on, on one side, but uh, it provides some kind of service, provide the facility need to set up their industry in one particular area. You put money concentrated in one place, to develop this place for, for more industry to move into this place. Not on policy side, but on the service side. I think that's good. That probably proved to be successful. We have few I visited in Nigeria, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, it's on the brink of going up. So that's something we encourage to try, but we are not quite sure whether it can work out or not. Mm -hmm. Please. Thank you. Mohamed Abu Shakra from, uh, uh, I'm a global shaper from Kairos Hub. Um, well, there is a consensus that uh, building entrepreneurship and small and medium enterprises is a, a, a focal point for starting a homegrown development in, in Africa. Uh, but the, the biggest challenge is that uh, oftentimes entrepreneurs and small and medium enterprises are faced by risk. And um, the risk is the oxygen of investment, but we, there is nothing who is guaranteeing for those who might face failure to come back and join the market. So my question for the panel is, don't you think it is really a big room for cooperation and partnership between the international community and investment community with Africa to build a room or a pool for, to guarantee and take the burden of risk from those who are coming new to the market? Mr. Coach? Uh, I think here the, uh, the important thing is that uh, the private sector has to work very much hand in hand with NGOs and governments together in order to build uh, something. And if, if you really want to develop a, a skilled labor work, they should not be only left to the governments, but the uh, private sector has to be completely involved in that because they know what the requirements are for what industry, for what uh, kind of uh, labor skill work. So they have to design this uh, system together uh, with the governments, and also NGOs will also play a uh, very uh, important role. And when you came with your investment and, 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 and bought De uh, Defy, did people say, oh, money's coming in, that's fantastic, or did you, uh, did you sense was, that, well, there was a little bit of concern that, yes, well, maybe was, this guy's going to come in and start firing people? There or? was a lot of skepticism at the beginning. Uh, a new mover coming from Turkey and acquiring a big chunk of asset here. And they didn't know whether we were going to shut down as, uh, plants or lay off people. And the unions were very hesitant and the workers were very fidgety. But in a very, very short time, we really uh, comfort them. And thanks God, we didn't shut any, down any plants. 
We didn't lay off any people. Quite the contrary, in two of the plants, we have introduced state-of-the-art technologies that we had, in, um, built new production lines, and now producing uh, very uh, efficient water and energy efficient products that are uh, sold at affordable prices. Please. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Tabo Kesi. I'm from Lesotho, working for Private Sector Foundation of Lesotho. Uh, my question uh, will be directed to Mr. Machungo. Uh, in most of our countries here in Africa, you'll find that before some of the development initiatives can be implemented, one will find that there are some consultations made at national level uh, from various stakeholders. So, regrettably, most of those initiatives do not yield the results as per their original specification. So, in the case of Mozambique, particularly on gas exploration, one would be interested to know the key features in your consultation processes, you know, to look after, you know, to ensure that uh, there will be a win-win situation. Thank you. Yes, before uh, I go to your question, I want to raise one thing that really uh, we have to take seriously the problem of, uh, of uh, developing SMEs in our country. And why we have really, this investor when they come to our countries, they really uh, will not, it's not easy in some circumstances, for instance, in Mozambique, to find uh, local people prepared to partner with them because they don't have capital, they don't have a spec experience, and so on. But it's not wrong to see things like that. We have an, a, a, a not tangible capital that can be used by foreigners to engage local entrepreneurs with them. What is the knowledge of culture, the knowledge of uh, institutions, to know how the government or the laws operated in Mozambique is very important to make this partnership work. It's very important. I will, uh, 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 I will uh, present my, uh, uh, my own experience. The Portuguese partner, when they come to Mozambique to build up the new startup operation banking in Mozambique, they said, we want only 50% of shares. The remaining to Mozambique partners. But we said, but Mozambique partners, they don't have capital to, 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 to <laughs> how, how to do that? No, no. They will, they will, they, 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 don't, they have capital. They don't realize that they have capital because I will not work in Mozambique because I don't know the situation in Mozambique. I don't know the culture of Mozambique. I don't know the institution of Mozambique. I need you to, in the board, in order to help me to develop my business. That's very important to take, that's an account. That in doing this, people are going to learn this is the kind of partnership, cut it under trainship, trainship too, trainship. And for instance, we began in Mozambique with, uh, uh, in this bank, with uh, more than 60% of employees were Portuguese. Now we had only 5% because the majority were trained at job, and now the bank is ruled by Mozambicans. Okay? Please. Uh, I'm Rajesh from United Phosphorus, a company in agribusiness. We have been uh, participating in Grow Africa, especially for agriculture. And we think that, sorry, sorry. Yeah. We think that uh, probably agriculture could be one of the most so, uh, solution for the, for the Africa because it can help in the unemployment, youth unemployment production because of the land and water resources, which is Unfortunately, we have not touched this subject. I'd like to know, or if someone from the panel could answer, that what you have been thinking, how should take Africa this question further to utilize the water resources, land resources, and build on the agriculture, which can solve not only the African problem, but it can also solve our food security issue. For the question is, concisely, the question is how we should able to take it further to concrete actions. Anybody want to make one concrete suggestion about how 
economic development can be fostered? No, I mean, just one aspect of it that you mentioned, the water management issues has been touched upon. They are it's very different in different parts of the African continent, but, but in some parts of Africa they are, of course, extremely political and extremely sensitive. Let's go to the other end of Africa, uh, the entire Nile, which goes from the heart of Africa to the Mediterranean. And, of course, the Nile is the source of life for X numbers of countries. And the management of that particular water is an extremely politically important issue. But as we now see, uh, both uh, numerous schemes to use it for hydropower, which is essentially a good thing, and we have massive investments coming in in terms of agribusiness. There's going to be a short, well, not necessarily a shortage, but there's going to be the need to expand uh, food production. And uh, I remember a figure that 60% of the land available for cultivation in the world as of yet is in Africa. And we see investments coming in from India, Gulf countries and whatever. Then the competition for these water resources is going to be more fierce. And there will be the need for more political agreement between states on how to manage that. The Congo River is another example which is of course huge in terms of water resources, extremely important to have agreements on how to manage that, both in terms of the power availability and in terms of the, the water for uh, agricultural production. But uh, Africa is rich, both in land and in water, but it needs to be managed. Please, we, we only have a few more minutes, so if you could ask the question quickly, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so we yeah, can have thank a, a you, few my, questions. Yeah, my name is uh, Philip Kirino, farmer from Kenya president of the Eastern African Farmers Federation. My issue... My Can you hold the microphone a little bit closer? My question goes to Machago on, on land. You know, Mozambique has become a fertile destination for foreign and direct investments in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So my question is, one, what are the incentives? In your opening remarks, you also said that uh, when you actually seek partnership and investments, you negotiate with the people and you are clear on benefits. How do you see, what, what have you negotiated with the people as regards that process of foreign direct investments in, in agriculture that has actually led to large acquisition? And finally, how do you see that process benefiting or contributing to your national food security in the long term, and especially in developing a domestic agricultural sector that can sustain long-term production and sustainable agriculture? Yeah, uh, in agriculture, uh, foreign direct investment in agriculture, in agriculture, we can see in which products you want to develop, you want to invest in foodstuffs, in sugar cane, or in um, forestries, and, or in which kind. Because if we take, for instance, sugar cane, we can take two possibilities. One is to rely on the local people to grow sugar cane by themselves and supply your factory. But you have to train them to grow better the sugar cane to supply, supply your factory. That's because you, we have land in Mozambique, of course, but if you want million of hectares of land, well, of land, you have to talk to the people because people are there. We have our own uh, law, law of land, uh, land law, land law. We have our own law, land law. And it's important to talk with communities, to make communities understand what we are going to do and what is their role in your project. And I won't talk to, or don't want to talk about fiscal incentives on something like that, but these incentives that you have to engage people, local people, in your project and to make local people to, to be in peace with you with your, in your project as provider of raw materials or as workers of your project. Okay? But beside, as I told you, beside that we have, I don't know if I understood well your, your, your question, but beside that we have uh, um, fiscal incentives and so on. Just a quick question for Ambassador Chon on, on the back of the, the issue of foreign direct mm -hmm. investment. I mean, you know, I guess the trade relationship between China and Africa couldn't grow much more than, certainly can't grow at the pace that it already has, right, over the last 
decade, something like 12 fold it's grown, mm -hmm. right? What's the future hold? Is, is it going to continue to, to grow? And, and is foreign direct investment going to be a bigger part of it? I guess it's like you were saying, it's easy to beat up on the Chinese, but, but maybe actually some of the, all of that money that's been pouring in isn't going to continue to pour in. And I'm not quite sure. Actually, this kind of question can only be answered by the market themselves. Mm. You have all your wish, you have one, you want this, you want that. But sometimes the fact not to be not so ideal like what you think. Even for the trade, I think 200 billion is big enough, but is there a potential? Yes, probably. But could there be anything? Now you export to Africa, then they move the assembly line into African continent. Then the trade figure will reduce. Right. The uh, direct investment will be bigger. So that could be change from time to time. It all totally depends on how the Chinese economy itself will transform into the next stage, become and what kind of size is that? there are a lot of question marks there, of course. And also African size. On African side, what kind of economy they are going to grow into in the next 10, 20 years? Please, sir. Is there a microphone there? Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Mohamed Fufana, a global shipper from Liberia. Uh, my question goes to um, Madame Nguka. Uh, during your deliberation, there was a statement placed on the floor by the moderator that uh, Africa do not need handout, we need handshake. Now, in so doing, you also budget by saying we need to train entrepreneurs. So, train entrepreneurs, my concern is what is the best mechanism or what are those recommendations or suggestions that can be put to the floor by African leaders to sustain the training of entrepreneurs for economic growth in Africa? Thank you. Yeah, well. I'm not an, an expert in the training of, of <laughs> entrepreneurs, but I think in a generic uh, sense, one of the shortcomings of our education system has been that we've prepared a lot of our students to seek work, not to create work and to become entrepreneurs. So in addition to the training that we provide to people post school so that they can enter into identifiable businesses, there's just the psyche of what we prepare people to do while they are still at the, at, at, at the lower grades. So for me, that I think is where the biggest shortcoming is. Let's prepare our young people to seek to be employers, to seek to create jobs, to seek to be entrepreneurs. And I think as parents, certainly of my generation, we thought that it was safer for people to first have a recognizable profession be a doctor, be a lawyer, and, and, and all of that. Yeah. And I just think that it just, it's just not the answer uh, that we need right now. And we need to influence the education system to work like that as well. We've, we've just got a couple more minutes. I want to ask you, this has been a very heady conversation. We've been talking for an hour. Yes. You each get 20 seconds. The last thing that you would like to say, Mr. Coach, 20 seconds, what needs to be rem what would you like to leave the audience with? Well, I think uh, as much as foreign investors have a great responsibility in enhanced, enhancing trade uh, in Africa, I think uh, their bilateral relations really have to be put in, uh, in, in, in order. That's the most important issue, in my opinion. The, 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 the countries in Af Africa with themselves. With him. Mr. Machago? Uh, the message I said that uh, really Africa is booming now, it's changing now. It's time to accommodate all partners, the emerging uh, economy uh, partners and the, 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 the traditional partners, and to make a trade balance so that we can have a better results on both cooperation on both sides. I'd, I'd just like that the people that invest in Africa, our partners in, in, in business, ensure that as we grow, as they invest in the in the, in the, in the grow, growing Africa, we also address issues of extreme poverty at the same time. Because I think that it's quite problematic that we are growing, but we're seeing extreme poverty persisting. Continue. And in particular, we also invest in women. Jin mm. Yeah, I think a little bit about the lady's question to me that to transfer know-how to Africa. Sometimes we ask about how do you become so successful? Tell me the know-how. And the, Sometimes probably we emphasize too much on our success, forget or ignoring what we have experienced. Just make people think that Chinese success so easily come with just blink of your finger. 
Actually, I can tell you that during the whole process of Chinese reform and open and become so successful, full of sweat, tears, sometimes a little bit of blood. It's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> uh, and now it's, it's, it's chance for Africa to come forward, to become rising. But in the whole process, we can share a lot of lessons we learned very hard in our own success and the reform. But be prepared. There might be some kind of hardship. Minister Bilt, accepting myself, you've on, got the final word. On the policy level, I would say integration, integration, integration. <laughs> Go for the, what is the success of China? It ended policies of isolation, opened up to the world and integrated with the global economy. That's sort of the bottom line also of China. So integration, 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 that will make Africa much stronger and that would be to the benefit of the entire world. All right, well, let's thank our guests, uh, Mustafa Koch, to my right, Mario Machango, Pumzile Nlambo Nutka, Madam Nutka, thank you, uh, Jinhua Chon, uh, Carl Bilt. Please let's all put our hands together and thank our speakers today. Thank you very much.